Thank you for having me here. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a different view and a different view uh, in the sense of a new way of doing computing and, and particularly a much faster way of doing computing. So, so the idea I want to introduce uh, is not just my idea, it's, uh, it's the idea of a team and, and what you're going to see today is, is, is many of the uh, small and large ideas that that team put together in order to make this happen. Right, so who remembers this? Who's used that before? Right, I've, I've learned typing on, on that kind of thing. And, and basically, there was a time when there was no computers, there was no ticket machines or train stations. We wrote on paper using these machines. And, and what I'm trying to tell you about today is, is, is a technology revolution which is very similar. And, and so now that we have computers which do nearly everything and can help us in, in so many ways of life, quantum technology may uh, be something just like that. So quantum physics is weird, very, very weird. And so there's the strangest things. A mechanical object can be in two different places at the same time. An atom can move forward and backward simultaneously, the same atom. Or an atom can tunnel for a solid wall. And then there's entanglement. Who's heard of entanglement before? That is really weird. That's a, Einstein called it a spooky action at a distance. So that, that is just really strange stuff. And scientists tend to uh, investigate these kind of very strange phenomena for a long time, but then they started building things out of it and making this work for, for the good and building quantum technology. So quantum technology, there's uh, three major applications for that. There's computing, so building unbelievably fast computers. Then there's a, a simulation, that means understanding nature, understanding how things are, understanding, understanding chemical reactions, making new pharmaceuticals, a lot of things which we have only a very limited understanding. And then, then cryptography, and that is uh, the ability to very safely uh, transmit information. So how fast are these computers? And the answer is very simple. Very, 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 very fast. And, and, and it's really hard to describe. So you, could, you could say something like, you know, a problem which even the fastest supercomputer right now takes a million years to calculate. A quantum computer may calculate in a few milliseconds. You know, and that even doesn't even quite hit it either. So, so this is probably the best description. Very, 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 very fast. Right, so now let's learn some quantum mechanics. So, so quantum mechanics is actually very simple, and I'm going to try to try, try to prove this to you right now. So what is a quantum state? So if I'm in a quantum state, I'm standing here on the left-hand side, that, is, that would be a quantum state. And I'm standing on the right-hand side, that is a quantum state. So that is, that is my particular quantum state of where I'm standing. There's other quantum states of, of an atom, for example, emitting light or not emitting light. That's a quantum state. Or an atom being on the left side of the room or on the right side of the room. So all these are quantum states. So that's all you need to know for now about quantum physics. Now, a quantum computer hosts bits, but they are actually not bits, they are quantum bits. And in, in a classical computer, it's basically a language, uh, as, as a set of symbols, zeros and ones, we call them bits. And that's basically how a classical computer stores information. The strange, the strange thing about quantum physics is that a quantum bit can be zero and one at the same time. So, so extremely spooky, extremely weird. And if you understand it, you're good, because I don't. So, so, <laughs> so, so, so this is just really weird, and you have to appreciate it. It is weird. Right, so let's, let's do a little ex experiment. So what is entanglement? That's another really spooky thing. Einstein immediately called it spooky. And, and so, so Im imagine, imagine the case. I've got a coin and, and somebody else got a coin here as well. It's, it's like somebody in the audience. So, uh, he's got a coin as well. So, so basically we both throw these coins and say it's a, it's a fair coin. So you throw it a few times and sometimes I get heads, sometimes I get tails. And he, he, does, he does the same thing. He throws his coin and sometimes he gets heads, sometimes he gets tails, and it's a very random process. Now, if these coins were entangled, then when I look at my coin, I would always get a random result, and when he looks at his coin, he also always gets a random result, but strange enough, we always get the same result. And then I, I can go to Australia with my coin, and I throw this coin, and I still get the same result as he does. We don't talk on the phone, there's no connection between these coins, they're completely random coins. That's entanglement. Now, there's a different way to think of entanglement too. Entanglement you can think of uh, in a graphic way. 
And now I want you to look at this cube. Now you can think, if you look at this cube, you can think, look at this cube in two different ways. You can, you can see, see it, as I show you, on the bottom left or on the bottom right. Like the, the, the front face can be either uh, on the left or on the right. right? Now if I, if I look at these two cubes, and I want you to look at this right now. And if you look at this right now, in your mind you can kind of either get the front face both to be on the left or the front face both to be in the right. Right? It's very hard to, to, to have the left cube have the front face on the left and the right cube have the front face on the right. So this is kind of what a graphical representation of entanglement is. That if you have these two cubes, they are always going kind to of appear the same. Right. And now let's uh, look at how we actually encode information, how we store information, and we actually store it in individual atoms, in single atoms. And each bright dot you see here is actually one atom, and each of these atoms is a quantum bit. And that's what we do. We can actually hold these atoms, and I'm going to show you in a second how we're actually doing it. So the best thing would be have some kind of fields, electric fields, because we have an, if we have an ion, so an ion is a charged atom which holds the ion in place. But there's a physics law which has not can't do. You can't have that kind of uh, field potential. So instead, we're having something like this, some kind of strange oscillating potential. Now, and, and I'm not going to expect that you believe me now that you can actually trap something in there. You know, so he, he, oh, he's, he's probably talking something funny, you know, he's probably, he can't trap in this. So I'm going to prove this to you right now. I'm going to prove this to you with a little, little thing we built out of an old record player. So we put a saddle on, on top of a record player, and now you can see we, we, the, the motor doesn't really work that well, so we have to help. Um, right, and so now you can see we put a ball on that spinning potential. Here we go. It is trapped. Okay. Now, but some of you may say, okay, it's a mechanical spinning potential. I'm not really believing this right now. What about an electric field? All right. So let's see whether, whether I can prove this to you with an electric field as well. So don't do this at home. What I'm going to show you next because you could kill yourself with that. All right. So this is what I'm going to show you next. We applied a lot of voltage onto this ring. And if you look on the left, left hand side, you can see these little particles floating magically inside this ring. And so this is a spinning electric field, and you can see these particles literally just floating. These are charged particles, they just float. Same mechanism. So this is our labs, and, and so you can see it looks like a lot of fun toys, and, and actually all of these things are very useful, so, but they're also fun to play with. So, 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 so you can see lasers, you can see optics, you can see vacuum systems, um, and all these things are needed in order to build a quantum computer. So this is how our lab looks like. In fact, this is a vacuum system. Now, if you ever end up on a space shuttle, and then if you kind of possibly suicidal and step out of the space shuttle without a spacesuit, then you will have much more air to breathe outside the space shuttle in, in outer space than you would have if you're inside this vacuum system. So there's absolutely nothing in there. All the air is gone completely, no particles, nothing is in there. And that's where we then trap single atoms. So a lot of achievements have been made building a quantum computer. And so, for example, we've built a 14 qubit quantum computer already. We've entangled ions and particles of light, ions and photons. We've teleported. Who likes Star Trek? You know, so, so uh, teleportation has been done with single atoms, and, and uh, quantum gates have been done, and all sorts of things have been done. But kind of where, where on, the idea I want to present to you right now is where we want to go right now is build a large scale device. So do this just like in a classical computer, go from like a single vacuum tube to our first big computer. So this is ENIAC, this was the first classical computer. And this is kind of what we want to do, uh, we want to really scale this up. And so the idea is to kind of have a, an, an, just like in a normal computer, some place where you store your ions, so kind of an array where you, where you hold these ions using electric fields. You have a processor just like in a normal computer where you then carry out these quantum gate operations. And then you move your ions by shuttling in this array from one zone to another zone. And so in fact the way we do this is we, we build actually microchips. So what you see on the left here is a microchip and then we combine the scalability of the, um, uh, the, these microchips to build very, very sophisticated structures with the ability to encode information in the individual atoms. 
So, so first of all, I'm going to show you how we actually entangle. So the way we entangle is, is starting with something like what's called a superposition state. So an atom being in two places at the same time or in two states simultaneously. And what you see here in this picture is you see a graph which shows you a sinusoidal curve. And if you go halfway up that sinusoidal curve, what that, what that curve tells you is that the atom is now in a superposition state of being in this one state or the other state. So that's a real experimental result. This shows you that actually really can be done. Now, if you want to make quantum gates, it's just like cooking. So you add microwaves, you know, so it's, it's perfect. And using microwaves, it turns out you can actually entangle. Then you use a very strong magnetic field gradient. So it's a, a magnetic field with a very strong slope. And then you use the, the fact that two ions basically are repelled by the electric charge and then basically move basically, they, they, it's like a spring basically. And all these ingredients together allows you to entangle ions and make these quantum gates. Now what's, what else is needed? You need architectures. So these architectures, I, one of them I show you right now, this is a microchip we made. And, and so this is basically a microchip basically which stores many, many trapped ions. And, in, and just to give you an idea, how would you make such a quantum computer work? This is a little picture. Uh, and what this shows you is basically ions moving in a little labyrinth. And you can see these little flashes. That is like microwaves or lasers basically doing the entangling operation. And, and, and if, you, if you look at this closely, you may, you may recognize you already worked in this field yourself as well. I mean, who's, who's played Pac-Man before? Here you go. Very, very similar, isn't it? So, so, so this is kind of how quantum algorithm is actually being executed. And, and this is how, how we're really making it. So this is basically a microchip. And you see these little islands, these little, these little uh, um, circular islands. And on top of these islands, that's where, where the ions are trapped above the surface. And these islands emit electric fields. And the electric fields can hold the, these ions and can move them along, can do all sorts of things with them. This is a ring trap, and, and remember I told you at the beginning, like what we're also interested in is understanding other systems in nature. And so this device is actually very useful in order to carry out quantum simulations to understand other systems in nature. And so this is another chip we've, we've developed in order to do that. So, so some, something else I want to show is a two-dimensional lattice where you can hold atoms inside a two-dimensional space. This is the vacuum system. You see a chip inside here. And if you zoom closer, you can see basically this microchip. You see that this, this really small structure. Now, this structure, what you see here, that is smaller than a human hair. It's extremely small. And if you look at this right now, you see an array of trapped ions above that surface. So you can see like each bright dot corresponds to one trapped atom. And each trapped atom is now basically uh, held by electric fields and can be now using microwaves or using laser beams. We can do things like put them in these strange quantum superposition states. We can do entanglement operation and we, uh, operations and we can, we can do even carry out quantum gates, all sorts of things basically to, to, to build a large scale quantum computer. So a very good question, I think, to ask is what could an unbelievably fast quantum computer do? And I'm, I'm going to ask this as a question. And, and I'm, I won't actually answer this question, and I'll leave this up to you, but I'm going to try to help you a little bit to answer this question. And, and in order to help you to answer this question, I'm going to tell you a little story. Tell you a little story about how the first classical computer was kind of uh, built together. And who, who, uh, there's, there's this big company, some of you guys may know, IBM, uh, who was really very well uh, instrumental in building the first computers. And, and the head of IBM, who started his company, when, when he... Uh, went out there and, and thought about, should I, should I invest into comp computing, should I make a company, he thought to himself, hmm, there's probably a market in the whole world for free computers, free of them. And this is, I think this is a big enough market, I'm, I'm going to start this company. So the reason I'm telling you the story is, is to show you basically how little we know about the future, how naive we really are, and how little we know of the possibilities of what such a new technology can really bring to all of us. So, so basically I leave this question with you and I want you to think about what could a really, really fast computer do. Thank you.